thank you for attending our annual G1 conference. Tonight, you will be joining thousands of viewers to take a deep look at the Bible's case for origins. We welcome many tonight who already believe the foundational teachings of Scripture on the topics we will cover. We pray your faith is made even stronger as we drill into these matters and discover together that the teachings of God's Word are in fact true. Even starting from the very first pages, many attending tonight are already Christians but haven't explored these topics deeply. Some are even skeptical. We ask you to engage in all three conference sessions to carefully consider the possibility that Scripture can in fact withstand the toughest pressure testing. We also welcome those attending tonight who are not yet Christians. Coming to Christ is the first step in a journey to a new life, one marked by both blessing and tribulation. We pray that all who attend tonight do so with open hearts and minds. These are life-changing truths, truths that can join your heart and mind together in your faith journey. No matter what your place is tonight, we make this special request that you listen with an open mind and heart. This is one reason we've turned chat features off to maximize engagement in each speaker's message. We answer all questions posed by our viewers. Please just email them to staff at genesisapologetics.com. This broadcast will be permanently hosted on the platform you're watching from tonight. Thank you again for attending. All right, welcome to the third annual G1 conference. My name is Joe Walters, and I am a pastor here in Sacramento at a church called Encounter in Atomas. And it is my honor to welcome you to this third annual G1 conference. I want to thank William Jessup University for letting us use this facility, and thank you, Dr. John Jackson, for your hospitality. Welcome to the thousands of you who signed up to this conference and who have a desire to know the truth of the scriptures. We are here to discuss the trustworthiness of God's word and specifically in Genesis creation accounts. Is Genesis just a story? Is it a poem? Is it, it, should it be taken literally? And people ask these questions. Christians ask these questions. Is Adam and Eve literal historical people? These questions are profoundly important to your faith. There is a lot at stake in this discussion. Over the next three sessions, you're going to get answers to these questions to give you the confidence and the boldness to know that you can trust God's word. We have speakers from Genesis Apologetics, the Institute of Creation Research, Answers in Genesis, Creation Ministries International, and speakers from William Jessup University. We have experts from all over the country that are going to be speaking to you over the next three sessions about Genesis and the trustworthiness of the Word of God. We have experts in archaeology, biology, apologetics, theology, molecular genetics. They will answer top questions about creation, Noah's flood, the Bible, dinosaurs, and much more. So let us commit our time together, our minds and our hearts, to hearing the truth of God's word and to understand it better. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for a time that we can gather together across the city, across the country, Lord, to hear from you, your word, your truth. Lord, I pray that you anoint each of the speakers to give them Lord, the power and the courage to speak your truth. We thank you, Lord, for gathering us together to love us, Lord, to speak to us. We ask that you use this time for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'd like to introduce to you Daniel Biddle, Ph.D., he is the president of Genesis Apologetics, a 501c3 organization dedicated to equipping youth pastors, parents, and students with biblical answers for evolutionary teaching in public schools. Daniel has trained thousands of students in biblical creation and is the author of several creation-related publications. Daniel's professional background includes training as a behavioral scientist and 20 years experience as an expert witness in state and federal cases involving statistical research methods. Thanks again for coming out this evening. We are so excited to be here and thanks to the thousands of people who signed up and are coming by ways of a small group or a family and understand that even some churches are joining all together. So I just wanted to cover a brief overview about our ministry before we get into some of the detail here. 
Uh, there are four different divisions of our ministry. The first is we love to strengthen Christian schools. So uh, we have about five or six schools in the, the local Northern California area that use our, our teaching and conference services on a regular basis. Our partner, uh, Vice President Dave Bisbee, heads most of those uh, sessions up, and I teach primarily in the high school at the college level. We also give an annual local church uh, presentations and conferences. There, there's this annual one at the G1 level, and we also give several that are done on more of a seasonal level, maybe two or three day church conferences that we do. And then uh, finally, we have a, a, a growing social media presence. We have about 111,000 YouTube subscribers that result in three or 4,000 views a day of the videos that we have. I think we have a library now of well over 100 videos. Um, and we have about 33,000 uh, Facebook followers as well. Uh, Dave's going to talk more about this, but I just want to highlight our K through 8 solution that we have. So if you have a student who's a kindergartner all the way through 8th grade, go to our K to 8 student zone from our webpage. We focus primarily on the K to 8 zone or K to 8 uh, level at, at that uh, section of our ministry. And Dave is, uh, I think he's about 12 different teaching videos now. He's going up to 72 different teaching videos that will be installed in that library. And they can be viewed at your leisure on both Facebook and YouTube. And then we have our debunkevolution.com program that's primarily targeted to 5th to 10th graders. And in that program, we cover about 10 different videos over about 6 hours of video lessons. And we take a, a typical standard uh, high school level biology textbook that's taught in secular schools, and we take the leading top 10 uh, pillars for evolution that are typically taught in a high school biology class, and we address them from both a biblical and scientific standpoint. And you can get that program free at just debunkevolution.com. Then if you have an older student, starting about 10th or 11th grade, we have our 7myths.com. And in this program, we take the seven leading myths or seven leading false teachings that are, are typically uh, coming against Christians in their faith when they're at secular high schools or at secular colleges. And even some Christian schools will still teach these things that are really against a historical perspective that's provided in Genesis 1 through 11. And that, again, is a video-based program. You can go there. You can see it on Amazon Prime. It's free on our website, and you can also view it on YouTube. And then we have uh, one of our leading books. It's called Answers to the Top 50 Questions about Genesis Creation and Noah's Flood. This is an interesting book and one that's dear to my heart because over the last several years, we had to field literally thousands of questions that would come in, stream through our Facebook page or through YouTube comments with people that were consistently asking questions. Thousands of them are coming in. And I started noticing, my gosh, a lot of these are the same. And so we started developing really cut and paste responses for a lot of the similar topics that people were bringing up. Then we noticed, my gosh, there's really about only 50 main questions that people are asking. There's maybe 200 typical ones, but the top 50 we, we took and put in this book, and about, oh, maybe about a quarter of these top 50 questions also have supplementary video training uh, to them as well. Things like, what about the different race groups? Or what about Noah's flood? Or how do you get all the animals on the boat? Uh, things like this are answered in this answers book, and they also have teaching videos that go along with them. Uh, we did our first full feature movie that just came out uh, last year called Genesis Impact. It's about a 40 minute movie where a young college student uh, goes into a museum where a docent is presenting the main, main line evidences for evolution and she starts a dialogue with them. Uh, with him for about 40 minutes, and we, in that video, we take the top 10 leading evolutionary icons that are used in museums, natural history museums all over the world, really, and address them in this fun kind of video format that's about 40 minutes. We take out the top 10 pillars of evolution that are typically displayed in natural history museums. Uh, we also have another feature film that will be coming out in about a month called Foundations. 
And that one's going to be a lot of fun because we take three different life journeys that, that start from a 10-year-old's life all the way to his deathbed and talk about the consequences of what you believe, what system you're going to believe in, what worldview you're going to believe in, and how that really does have implications and how our life's played out from a day-by-day day by day and decade-by-decade decade, uh, basis. So that movie will be coming out in about a month or two. If you go to our YouTube channel, uh, which is shown here, we have, again, about 110,000 subscribers. We just crossed over 10 million views. Uh, and I wanted to just quickly highlight some of our, our favorite videos there. And this is real interesting to me because we, we did these videos not knowing which ones were going to be the popular ones. And it was a big surprise for us to fly and find out that really dinosaurs, Noah's flood, the miracles of the crucifixion of Christ, and, uh, and one about behemoth or sauropod dinosaurs turned out to be our most watched videos uh, that we have. In fact, the Noah's Flood video is now going on 3 million views. It's probably the most watched flood video in history. There's a lot of different ways you can look at that, and it's certainly not our doing. We just took about a year and interviewed the, letting, the leading flood geologists from the top three creation ministries and distilled it into a video that we were really happy uh, how it turned out because it provides about 23 minutes of very concrete, very compelling evidence of the physical mechanics that happen on Earth during that year-long time of Noah's flood. And then if you're interested on in the five different miracles that happen at the crucifixion of Christ, we now just did a second version of that movie. You guys, there are some amazing, physically confirmable things that happened 2,000 years ago at the death crucifixion, and burial, resurrection of Christ that we can actually go back and see today and prove through, through some good historical evidence that that event, the resurrection of Christ and the crucifixion really actually happened. So I would encourage you guys to, uh, to watch that video. And then lastly, we have our, our mobile app, the Genesis Apologetics mobile app. We have over 100,000 users that have download, downloaded that app. And what this app does is it really pipes into our YouTube channel to the leading videos there, but you can download this app on the iTunes or Google Play stores. It's a free app, and you can go to that app and watch our different, uh, our different videos there. Now, some of the topics that you guys are going to hear today are going to be uh, new. Some of them are going to be not novel, and frankly, some of them might be unbelievable to many of you. Things like man walking with dinosaurs and man living contemporary with, with dinosaurs. These are some amazing things to hear and some things that I found really challenging when I was a Christian and started learning about these things, but things that I firmly believe now. Um, but these are not new things. We're not quack scientists up here with presenting new theories. These are really grounded theories. Thousands and thousands of scientists take the same perspectives that we're going to be sharing in this conference. Uh, and leading curriculum providers. Over 90% of Christian K-12 through schools, at least all those in the, in the California region, uh, about 90% of them do teach Genesis as a real historical narrative. And these are, are places where there are hundreds of students going and they're using a curriculum like Bob Jones University or Rebecca, things like that. So the, it is a predominant viewpoint that we're going to be sharing from today. And also, of course, leading ministries like Answers in Genesis and Creation.com or, or CMI and ICR also hold to these same biblical perspectives. So with that, I'm going to transition and hand it over now to, uh, to Dave Bisbee, who's our vice president, to cover the student zone. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. So I'm Dave Bisbee, vice president of Genesis Apologetics. And today I want to talk to you about our brand new program called the K-8 Student Zone. So, but before we do that, I want to give you just a little bit of background. First of all, why is it important to teach apologetics to kids? I mean, isn't it all about Jesus? Yes, it is, but let's take a look at a few things. So, based upon some research, there is a very disturbing prediction. Two out of the three kids that are in church programs when they hit college, are going to walk away from their faith. Now, I can tell you, I can relate to that because I was one of those kids. Allow me to share my story. So when I was a boy, I was sent to a very strict private school, and I was that kid, you know, the one over in the corner that always asked why, asking question after question. And unfortunately, this was the response I got. Just believe, 
sit down, be quiet, and just accept it. Well, it didn't take long for me to conclude that, you know what, they really didn't have any answers. I also developed a very warped view of God, that he was some angry guy in the sky, just waiting for me to slip up and just smash me on the head. Now later, in high school, I went through some very dark years. And I had some friends that were Christians, but you know what, I really couldn't relate to them. Their lives seemed to be so perfect and mine was just so dark. And my questions were met with silence. So I concluded then that they too didn't have any answers. So as an adult, I decided to try the church thing. And once again, my search came up empty. I'm really glad to report, though, that God never gave up on me. So what can we do to prevent this type of thing from happening? Well, I'll tell you what we can, should not do is this. Um, I can tell you firsthand that beating people the head over with arguments and theology just doesn't work. In fact, my life verse is this. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us to always be ready to provide an answer. But notice what it says. Be prepared to provide an answer. That presupposes that somebody's asking you a question. Now, why would they ask you a question? Well, hopefully, as a Christian, you are living in a way that you're loving people, and you're kind, and you're honest, and they notice that you're different, and then they want to ask you about your faith. So, which leads me to the zone. So, during this COVID crisis, the Lord put it on my heart to do a video series, which is kind of comical because I do not like to be on camera. But, okay, God, we're going to do this. So I built a little, tiny little studio in my, in my uh, garage, and we went from there. So as you can see, we've got a lot of different topics to cover here. And these are topics that are not typically taught in Sunday school programs. The purpose of all of this is so that students can develop a confident faith and that they're confident in going out and sharing the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. So there are two ways to access the zone. One is through our YouTube channel. But I would really encourage you to go to the website shown on the screen here. There you can find the videos, and you can also find some handouts and activities, which will hopefully enhance your students' learning. Alam Dave Bisbee, I hope to see you soon on the zone. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome to you Dr. John Jackson. He is the president of William Jessup University. Prior to joining Jessup as its sixth president in March 2011, John served as the executive director of Thriving Churches International and as a senior leader of Bayside Church in Granite Bay, California. He is the founding pastor of LifePoint Church in Minden, Nevada, and previously was the executive minister of the American Baptist Churches of the, specific, the Pacific Southwest, now Transformation Ministries, where he was responsible to serve more than 270 churches in four western states. John also served as the senior pastor in several staff roles at First Baptist Church in Oxnard and as the youth pastor of the First Baptist Church in Buena Park. Dr. Jackson earned both his PhD and his master's in educational administration and organizational studies from the University of California, Santa Barbara an MA in Theology, Christian Formation and Discipleship at Fuller Theological Seminary, and a BA in Religion, Christian History and Thought from Chapman University. Hi, my name is John Jackson and I'm the president of William Jessup University. I wanna thank you for letting me share with you here today. And I decided that what I would do is I would share my conclusions at the very beginning. That'll allow you to know where I'm coming from and it might end my talk a little bit sooner. But before I do, let me share a story with you. It's a story of a little girl. She was in an art museum, and she knew more about theology than some people did. As she was walking through the art museum, she saw a painting of Adam and Eve. That little girl stood next to that painting and raised her little fist and said, You ruined everything! That little girl knew a lot more than some of us. Let me share with you four conclusions that I start with. I think they'll be helpful for you to understand my perspective on these matters. Uh, number one, I want to contend that truth matters and grace matters. An unflinching commitment to the Word of God is the only secure foundation in a world that's cut loose from any moorings of truth. Number two, if Genesis 1 through 11 is an allegory, 
then Jesus accommodated himself to the ignorance of his audience, or worse, maybe he didn't know any better. If Genesis is not true, then humanity, sin, salvation, marriage, family, history, good and evil are all social constructs subject to change depending upon cultural norms. Number three, to deny the historical Adam is to stand against the teachings of Moses, Luke, Jesus, and Paul. And again, they were either confused, deceived, or even worse. And finally, number four, denying the truth of Genesis is like unleashing an army of termites under the foundation of a wooden home. In time, everything crumbles. What we know about free will and sin and salvation and family and gender and identity and marriage all crumble in time. I believe Genesis 1 through 11 is the hermeneutical issue of our day. The dignity and fall and hopes of humanity all rest on the story of Adam and Eve. In fact, B.B. Warfield, a famous systematic theologian, said this, the unity of humanity in Adam is the postulate of the entire body of the Bible's teaching, of its doctrines of sin and redemption alike. So it's a whole structure of the Bible's teaching, including all that we know as its doctrine of salvation rests on it and implicates it. I want you to be clear about this. The God of reason and the God of revelation are one and the same. He cannot contradict himself. There's no conflict between right science and right scripture. The fact is, is that when there appears to be a conflict, we either have incompleteness or error on one side or the other. Now, many of you know my background. You know that I'm a pastor, but you also know that I've been a higher education leader in a faith-based, a Christian setting this last decade. I am deeply committed, uh, committed to the proposition that biblical truth is the foundation for everything. I also want you to hear this. I think there are four things that God wants for you. God wants you to be saved. He wants you to be grounded. He wants you to be healed. And he wants you to be equipped. But you know, we live in a world that has a problem with authority and truth. It used to be that we could think about truth from the conduct of a, uh, maybe scripture is truth, that you could just make that assertion and people would rest with that. Or you could say, well, uh, a pope, or some scholar or community of scholars, what they say is our source of authority. But we live in the modern era. In the modern era, we've introduced something else, and that is the concept of experience. For many in our modern world, our experience is the final determinator of truth. My experience is what determines truth around me. I experience things, and therefore, my truth might be different than yours. Let's begin by being very, very clear. I believe that God is the only source of final authority and truth. In John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, Jesus Christ himself said this. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. A lot of times people pass Jesus off as a good teacher. Well, you may not know this. 78 times in the New Testament, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Many people in our modern age say, well, all religions are, are, are different, but they're all kind of the same. What works for you might not work for me. My experience is what determines reality. And in fact, the ultimate value being lifted up in a number of contexts these days is uh, experiential truth. My experience is truth. And quite frankly, a lot of people who claim to be scientists are looking at physical evidence and essentially interpreting through their own lens. Tolerance is the new reality. In fact, I wanted to share a quote with you. Thomas Helmbach, the executive vice president of the National Lambda Chi Alpha, has about 280,000 members in 195 college campuses. This is what he explains. Quote, the, defini the definition of new tolerance is that every individual's beliefs, values, lifestyle, and perception of truth claims are equal. Let me reread that. The definition of the new tolerance is that every individual's beliefs, values, lifestyle, and perception of truth claims are equal. There is no hierarchy of truth. Your beliefs and my beliefs are equal. And all truth 
is relative. That's the world that you live in. And quite frankly, sadly, that is often the determinative world of higher education. Relativistic truth or relativism requires truth to be dependent upon social, personal, historical, and linguistic factors. Not absolute factors, but relative ones. This stands in stark contrast to a biblical worldview. Here at William Jessup University, we are deeply committed to a kingdom of God worldview, to a biblical worldview, to a gospel worldview. We do believe that Jesus Christ, when he talks about the truth, he's declarative. And when Jesus Christ affirms the Genesis narrative, that means something to us. Francis Schaeffer described absolute truth this way. He said, if there's no absolute moral standard, then one cannot say in a final sense that anything is right or wrong. By absolute, we mean that which is always applies to all people, that which provides a final or ultimate standard. There must be an absolute if there are to be morals, and there must be an absolute if there are to be real values. If there's no absolute, be, be, uh, excuse me, if there's no absolute beyond man's ideas, then there's no final appeal to judge between individuals and groups whose moral judgments conflict. We are merely left with conflicting opinions. Some of you uh, hearing this talk have probably participated in one form of social media or another. You know the reality that in our world, social media is almost like a mud fight at times. Mud gets slung back and forth, and at the end of the day, quoting Bible verses, as I've often done, uh, saying to somebody that your opinion is based on revelation literally doesn't carry the day. For a lot of people, what matters is their opinion. My opinion, my experience, that's automatically equal, as we heard from the quote earlier, to anything else that you might have to say. Well, the Bible makes it clear that all beliefs and values and lifestyle are not equal. The Bible teaches that the God of the Bible is the true God. You can look in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10, and that all his words are true, Psalm 119, verse 160, and that if something is not in, right in God's sight, that it's flat out wrong, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 and 8. This is not just the view of Hebrew culture or Christian culture or Western culture. It's the truth according to the God who rules over all cultures revealed in God's Word. Truth matters. Grace matters. The law came through Moses, but Jesus was full of grace and truth. And our challenge as you prepare for this conference is to say, how can we discern the truth of God's Word? How can we discover and learn the truth of science and make sure that we're being able to understand the world we live in in alignment with the revealed Word of God while simultaneously loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Here at Jessup, when we first launched the sciences, I actually had newspaper reporters ask me this question. Is it possible, Dr. Jackson, that you can be a Christian school full of faith and you can also really be rational scientists? They saw a conflict between the two. I want to assure you fully and completely, as you will learn throughout the day, you can be 100% committed to the authority of God's Word and 100% committed to the discovery of real science and what our world tells us about the nature and character of God. Genesis matters. Genesis to Jesus matters. Genesis to you matters matters. If Genesis is not true, and if Jesus is not true, then we'll simply devolve into whatever truth fits our personal or cultural narrative. You know, our culture has changed over time, and I remember a time, uh, it was quite a few years ago, where people were upset about some of the things that were being said in culture. And so what they decided to do as Christians, followers of Jesus, is develop a bumper sticker. It was a good bumper sticker. This is what it said. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Well, you know, that was a good bumper sticker. And at the time, it created kind of a good reaction. God said it. 
I believe it, that settles it. But the more I thought about that bumper sticker, I actually think it's off the mark. I think the way the bumper sticker should have read is, God said it, that settles it, I believe it. Now what I believe is that you can do real scripture and you can do real science. And if you will do real scripture and real science, you will end up understanding the narrative from the first page of Scripture to the last page of Scripture in a way that honors the person and work of Jesus Christ, the personhood of Adam and Eve, and the narrative that Scripture provides for us of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation, the whole story arc of the gospel. God said it. That settles it. I believe it. That is the truth. And from Genesis to Jesus, we can be absolutely clear that the God who made everything is at work in our world. It's been a delight to share with you, and I think I've actually saved a few minutes off your total conference time by telling you my conclusions in advance. God bless you, and have a great day. Thank you again for coming tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to be covering one topic that is very, very near and dear to my heart about why are creation apologetics important, and I want to look at Genesis as the foundation of the gospel. And I want to start out by making a very bold statement, which is this. A Christian's faith and their eternal effectiveness will only be maximized if they fully believe in the history of the Bible and are empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's my opinion that you really need to have both of those things if you want to live a fully empowered, uh, fully effective Christian life. Because if you don't believe in the historicity of the Bible, you're going to be carrying a lot of cognitive dissonance in your mind and your heart's not going to want to go out and evangelize to people because your head is like an anchor, not believing in the truths of God's word. And secondly, if you're not filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, you won't be there and present and ready to be used. Uh, Ephesians 2 uh, says that we are God's workmanship prepared to do good works, which he has prepared in advance for us to do. The only way we're going to run into those situations, I believe, is that if we're paying attention, we're listening, and we're directed by the power of the Holy Spirit. So here's what students uh, are up against today, at least in the state of California, and it's going to be similar in other states, is in the state of California between 6th and 10th grade, there is a barrage that happens with students where they're given about 50 hours, 50 classroom hours of instruction on evolution that spans over 250 pages of evolution teaching. They have uh, uh, Lucy and other human evolutionary icons in sixth grade world history. They've got about 90 pages of evolution and life science, which is usually in seventh grade. And they have biology, which is typically about 150 pages. Uh, or about 15% of their biological text is, is usually on evolution. So this is what Christians are up against today, and it's having a significant impact uh, in the faith of our Christian students. Uh, millennials today want to know, how many pages do I have to turn in the Bible before I run into truth? Truth that I can understand, the truth that's not allegorized or mythology. They want to know, if the truth doesn't begin on page one, how many more pages do I have to flip before I'm going to run into truth? We believe that truth starts on page one. I want to look here at a scripture passage called the parable of the sower, uh, where God, or Jesus is giving this, this analogy, and he's talking about the seed, which is God's word or the kingdom uh, of God. And he talks about these four different conditions in which these se the seed goes out. So the DNA of the seed has a potential to grow and it's going to grow, but it falls in these different types of soil conditions that are going to result in growth or not. There's uh, birds by the wayside that can come and eat up the seed. There's a stony soil, thorns, and then there's fertile soil. So we'll watch a short video here that will explain and overview this parable. The parable of the sower. Behold, the sower went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. 
and after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. So to, to summarize, we have four different types of soil situations for the seed. The first is where it says that Jesus says the devil is going to come and take away the word that would have otherwise been planted in their hearts and their minds that would have grown up into productive action. So that's one thing that can happen is the devil can come and take away the word. The next situation is the seeds have no root. They take place in believers that believe for a while, but then they fall away. The next one is when the seed is choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And then, of course, is what we want, which is the good soil, where they're going to return 30, 60, or 100-fold what's planted in them. So if you break these down, the first one, where the devil comes and takes away the word, can be a parallel to someone that just has disbelief. They come under tribulation or persecution because of the word, and they said, you know what, it just must not be true anyhow. The next one can be doubt. If they have no root and it's not taking place, they start believing God's word, then it hits a rock and they can't believe it anymore, that would be like doubt. Uh, choked with cares, riches, and pleasures are analogous to when people are distracted by the world so, so the seed of God's word will not grow. Then, of course, there's a good ground. We want to focus on these top two, the disbelief and the doubt. This is where creation apologetics can really shine because they can help people understand that God's word is true from the start. They don't have to doubt it. And then their roots can grow deeply. Those seeds will be secured and then fruitful trees. So Jesus is talking here and he says, because the, the seed had no root, it withered away. And he's talking and says that some fell along stony places where they did not have much earth and they immediately sprang up. We have a lot of quick believers here, so sometimes it happened, uh, because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up and they were scorched and because they had no root, they withered away. He goes on and says, but, they, uh, but he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself. He endures for a while, but when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. And we've been doing this ministry for a while. I can't tell you the number of parents that have come up to us and said, I raised my kid in church. They went to Wednesday night youth group and they went away to their first semester of college at a secular school, and they're come back uh, now for Christmas as a self-reported atheist. It happens quite a lot, and it's because of this tribulation that happens and the doubt and the disbelief that can, that can foster into a, a, a faith that just does not stick. So tribulation means a pressing, a pressing together, or pressure or oppression, affliction, tribulation, distress, and straits. So... In order to get a college degree nowadays, you're required to go through at least seven different specific courses that they regard as core coursework, things like geology and philosophy and other classes like this, where the student is going to get inundated and bombarded with evolutionary thought. They need to be prepared for that. And persecution uh, is, is to put the fight or to drive away. So a lot of these seeds that are planted in the, in the minds and hearts of students today are going to come under this type of pressure. Here's an example of what type of persecution we can get, all the way from when there are kids listening to programs like that shown on the screen or the crudes of these movies. I was on a plane once, and the person to my left was watching The, the War of the Planet of the, Planet of the Apes, person to my right was watching the movie about Lucy that's all about, it's based on how we only supposedly use 10% of our brain, which is another myth. And so here are just two people right on a plane watching these movies being steeped in movies that were overtoned with evolutionary thought. So, and of course, there's a 250 pages of evolution teaching that they're going to get, uh, get in school. So these students nowadays are under a lot of pressure, a lot of tribulation, 
And here the, the word says, but the ones on the rock are like those who when they hear, receive their word with joy, but they have no root, who believe for a while and in time of temptation or testing, they fall away. We want God's word to grow deeply in people. And we think that it has to go down all the way down to Genesis. If they're not believing Genesis 1 to 11 is real history, their roots are going to start going down and then they're going to hit rocks of, oh, what about the science and Bible? What about Charles Darwin? What about deep time? What about ape to human evolution? A lot of Christians today, their faith tentacles are starting to go down in the root system in the soil, but they're bumping into rocks and they're stopping. And if the roots don't go down, the tree will not fruit or it will only have a little bit of fruit. We believe that a strong root system requires a thorough, deep belief and understanding of Genesis 1 to 11 as real history. Um, what happened to me when I was a, a teenager and, and going through my, my young 20s, I did believe in the Bible. I would say I was a spirit-filled Christian. I loved Christ, loved his word. I was just undeclared on the origins idea. I didn't know any better. And then later in life, when I under, came to understand that the Genesis account was real history, I had to go back and build these kind of things, these root structures called stilt roots. This is a particular species of palm tree that grows up, and when it's in this different type of, of area, it's got to have stronger roots. So these roots come down after the fact and make the tree strong. That's exactly what I had to do in my life. I had to go back and regrow some deeper roots that I would have stronger faith. We don't want to be like this tree that did not have a tap root that hits the nearest storm, didn't have deep soil, and is able to just fall right over. We want to have wide roots, and we also want to have a tap root. A tap root is one that goes down deep so that when you hit the, the winds and the tides of life, you're still going to stand strong. Psalms 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law, or the word could be Torah there, which is the first five chapters of the Bible, including Genesis, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper." That is a promise from God's word that if we study and meditate and believe and revere in God's word, our root tentacles will go down deep and we will not fail to bear our fruit in season. Even when we go buy a, a dog, you can go get a dog and based upon how much you're going to pay and what kind of uh, breed you're going to get, you can get a certificate of pedigree. A lot of the students that attend our seminars that haven't been raised with the biblical worldview, they don't, they're walking around without any pedigree. They have no identity in Christ or back to Adam or they don't understand the human plan, the, the human history that goes back to the time of Adam. They're untethered in the universe and ungrounded many times and they're seeking identity in all types of worldly outlets because they don't have paper, they don't have pedigree that anchors them into the biblical account. A friend of mine, her name is uh, Taylor, she flipped into a creationist when she was about 17 years old. She had before been believing all the stuff about evolution. She was an AP biology and psychology, and she had, was steeped in evolutionary worldview. And then she ran into the flood account, and we talked with her more and more, and she converted and flipped to a creationist. She would say it was like being born again, again. She then took a 17-foot page-long wainscoting. It was a big wall poster that she, around, she surrounded in her dorm room that has the whole history from Adam going all the way back up to present time. And she says, I feel so much more stable in my life now, knowing where my life fits in the context of history. So we want people to have a pedigree in God's word, a pedigree in our history, understanding where our role is uh, in this place, which is ultimately to have uh, produce glory for, for God. I was at a museum once, uh, the Royal Terrell Museum up in Canada. It's the biggest dinosaur museum in the world. My daughter and I uh, were there. And we got to witness this mom with about a 10-year-old son staring into a museum display that kind of had a goo to the zoo, to me and you, uh, icon exhibit that had the whole start, of beginning of creation into pond scum stuff that led to these things, led to these things, all the way up to humans. 
And you could see the young man, this 10-year-old ten, this ten young man, just staring at it, and he was shocked. I was looking at him going, wow, what's wrong with this kid? And then he asked his mom, he says, Mom, is this true? Are we evolved pond scum? I mean, does, is this really my case? Is this my pedigree? And the mom had a long pause, and my daughter and I were just five feet from her, and the mom says, well, I, I, I guess it is. Right there in that moment, that mom just stamped that kid's pedigree with untethered. No place in history, no reason to live other than humanistic worldview and values and everything. How much different would that teenager's life show up and be if the mom said, you know what? That's the story of the idea of the world. But we have a place in history and God's word and he made us. And then we had, and we sinned and fell and we went against him and God had to you know, wipe out the whole earth and we started us over and then Jesus and salvation, redemption, that kid would have had grounded identity. But in now, because of what happened in that instance, and you could see his face just change in that instance, like, oh my gosh, I'm just an evolved worm. That's went through what, what went through his mind. So next I'd like to contrast, well, why is biblical creation apologetics important compared to some other ones? And I know I'm probably going to get a lot of emails about this, but I think it's very important, so I want to get into it. So biblical creation, Genesis 1 to 11, is real history, talks about our purpose, being accountable to a God who made us, it talks about biology and origin and the epic flood. Then, on the other hand, there's philosophical apologetics, and I'm all for a lot of that. I think a lot of those things are important. We want to talk about the culture fit for Christianity. We want to address questions like, are there many ways to God, the relevance of Christianity, and how could God do X, Y, or Z? I understand there's a lot of philosophical questions out there that need to be answered, but I want to argue that biblical creation eclipses those theoretical or philosophical apologetics for the reason that if you don't have a root system, if you don't understand the pedigree, where we came from, how we got here, sin, fall, the flood, a lot of the other things are not going to matter in the first place. Consider this tree. Now let's go to a different tree metaphor here. We have the top of the tree and we have the branches and the twigs and the leaves. Then on the bottom part we have the trunk and the bigger branches and the root system. You can view philosophical or cultural apologetics as these top parts of the tree. They can sometimes sway in the wind, they're going to change sometimes, they're subject to the influence of culture many times, and oftentimes the answers for philosophical apologetics are going to change for each generation. Whereas Genesis 1 to 11 as real history is not going to change. It's permanent. It's solid and lasting over time. It withstands the changing winds of culture and it can go multi-generationally. It's foundational. So what we see a lot is that students who want to focus on the top of the tree and spend a lot of time in philosophical apologetics are not going to be really strong, but those who have a strong foundation and a worldview of Genesis 1 to 11 as true history are going to start and draw from the strength of having a root system and then from that worldview can then build a, a scaffolding of the rest of their understanding, the rest of their perspectives and views about worldview that are going to be super strong because they're based on a trunk system and a root system that's based in historical, true Christianity. So if your faith starts at the top of the tree and then stays there, your faith won't likely last very long. If you, you can answer a few philosophical questions or have a, have a couple of good comebacks, your faith is not going to be very strong. But if your faith starts at the bottom of the tree and goes up, you'll have a different worldview and your faith will in fact be grounded and strong. The further away one gets from the roots, the more susceptible they'll be to the changing winds of culture. And the arguments higher up the tree are only strong if the roots are strong. So without knowing that the Bible is historically true and scientifically credible, one will be more inclined to sway to the philosophies of the world. And if people can really understand completely from an actual historical standpoint that Genesis actually unfolded as plainly written, they will have a solid faith and the rest of the truth tree, if you will, will fall into place and be stronger. 
Um, of course, as the president of Genesis Apologetics, we get, I get criticized a lot, and people say, well, why can't you just let people believe whatever they want? They can have gap theory or old age, or they can think God used evolution. Why are you guys tossing around trying to split all these differences? And I challenge him by saying this, what if Jesus Christ himself manifested right here, right now in the street corner, and he said, I want you to follow me, and he took you and a hundred others into a movie theater, and he pressed the rewind button. And it just so happened for the next hour in this movie, you got to see history rewind for just only 6,000 years. You got to go back 3,000 years ago and see the time of David and the time of Abraham. Then you rewind and you've got all Noah's sons. Then you've got the Tower of Babel. And then you've got the flood. And oh my gosh, your eyes are huge at this point. Look at that. God wrecked everything. And look at all those people trying to survive in the flood. And then you go back before that and you only have 1,600 years or so of creation and people falling apart because of sin, then you have six ordinary days of creation. And I ask people, if you got to watch that movie, and it's true, would it change the way you lived your life today? And the honest answer is absolutely yes. I feel like I got to watch that movie because I, I've drilled into these things. I've looked into the flood and dinosaurs and the biblical account, and I have like post-creation exposure shock. I know these things right now to the point where they're, they're electrifying in my mind. And I, can, I go to these movies nowadays. I look at the worldview presented on the History Channel and Nova and PBS and all these things. And I'm really aware, wow, there are two truly different worldviews. There's what the world wants everyone to believe and the smoke and mirrors that go along with it. And then there's what God has laid out in the creation account. And if you understand it to be true... Everything in your life is different. The way you raise your family, the, where you spend your money, who you talk to, what you say, it's really a, a life-changing truth, believing that Genesis is history. And a couple of concluding thoughts here is that uh, Jesus said in Luke 9, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Uh, Colossians 2 admonishes, Therefore, if you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Uh, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world and not according to Christ. Uh, Ephesians 4 says we should no longer be like children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things who is the head or Christ. And 1 Timothy 6 says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to your trust, avoid profane and vain babblings, and the oppositions of science falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Okay, uh, my final exhortation uh, is this. I do believe that what the word says in, in 2 Corinthians 2.11, it admonishes us and says, you know, be aware or less, don't let Satan uh, take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. I see today that many parents are distracted and were deceived by the world's ideas about origins. And sadly, I see a lot of churches also that punt on the origins topic. They say things like, oh, Genesis is controversial, so let's just not teach anything about Genesis. Or that's like saying, let's just teach about the house, but not about the foundation. I meet a lot of Christians nowadays that say, well, I'm just a New Testament Christian. I don't really have to deal with all the miracles of the Old Testament. So that's a sad thing that we see uh, in today's churches. They're just, they're punting on the origins issue. They're not bravely confronting it and teaching through it. I believe to this, the enemy responds by saying, oh, look, that, that's fine. Without teaching Genesis and into this gap, this wide open gap, I will fill today's youth with the idea that, quote, science has clinched the proof that we randomly evolved from mutated mammals over millions of years, so students won't even believe the Bible is credible. I will destroy the first page of the Bible so that they'll think the rest is just a fairy tale. 
And that's one thing we see going on in the landscape uh, today. But we believe that dodging uh, this controversial bullet about being contentious about issues surrounding origins, many churches have lost the battle for some right out of the gate. And I think it's time that we face this uh, issue very boldly. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome Dr. Brian Thomas. He is a research associate at the Institute for Creation Research. Brian Thomas received a master's in biotechnology in 1999 from Stephen F. Austin State University in Texas and a PhD in paleobiochemistry in 2019 from the University of Liverpool. He taught junior high and high school at Christian schools in Texas, as well as biology, chemistry, and anatomy, and as an adjunct and assistant professor of Dallas area universities. In 2008, Dr. Thomas joined the Institute of Creation Research as a scientist, a science writer, and editor contributing news and magazine articles, speaking on creation issues and researching original tissue fossils. He was appointed as research associate in 2019. He is the author of Dinosaurs and the Bible and a contributor to Guide to Creation Basics. Creation Basics and Beyond and Guide to Dinosaurs, Guide to the Human Body, Guide to the Universe and Dinosaurs, God's Mysterious Creatures, his dissertation, Ancient and Fossil Bone Collagen Remnants, is available in book form. Welcome, Dr. Brian Thomas. Hello and welcome to the best session at the G1 conference. It's the dinosaur session. I hope you guys are ready for this. Uh, I am a dinosaur scientist, and so obviously it's my favorite topic. And uh, I talk about dinosaurs. Um, they're just so interesting and fascinating, and I love to put the pieces of the puzzle together uh, about how dinosaurs, instead of refuting the Bible, actually confirm the Bible in three different ways. So, Welcome to the Institute for Creation Research here in Dallas. Uh, I'm here at the, um, um, the Discovery Center for Science and Earth History, and boy, we've got uh, a beautiful stage and beautiful facilities here, and um, we want you to come visit. So whenever you're in town in Dallas, come and see the Discovery Center. You can walk through a room of Noah's Ark. Uh, you could see um, a diorama of the life of Christ. Uh, we've got dinosaurs on display, 360 videos. You can go into experience the Ice Age. You know, we have a lot, a lot going on here. Um, and we have, we have dinosaurs going on today. So, uh, so I've got three questions that we're going to answer, and I'm going to let science do the answering for us. And the first question is going to be, where did they come from? Who will answer the question, where did they come from? Uh, well, I was taught that they came from evolution over millions of years, and that's where they came from. Um, but here I am at the, outside the, um, the Field Museum in Chicago, leaning on this brachiosaur uh, leg. Ah, these things were immense, just tremendous size, stature, structure. How do you, how do you uh, build, let's say you're going to build a building and you want it to walk around. You want to build a, uh, you know, maybe the Star Wars AT-AT walker, you know, something like that, where it's a giant thing and it walks around and it's heavy. I mean, how do you do this? Um, and if you look at the details of the construction of these animals' bodies, we start to come up with good answers as to where did they come from. Did they come from natural processes, or does their construction demand supernatural processes? I came to believe the latter, especially after I saw this placard, this sign on display at the Field Museum in Chicago, and it says sauropods, sauropods, you know, that's the dinosaurs with the four legs, long necks, four legs that go down, long necks, uh, long tails, were, sauropods were engineered. They were engineered. Well, last I checked, anything that's engineered was engineered by an engineer. <laughs> it's like a painting was painted by a painter. That's, uh, that's just, it's just intuitive and it's valid. Uh, and so there's every reason to think that, hey, if these things were engineered, then an actual engineer must have done that engineering uh, and not natural processes. And specifically, we're going to zoom in on this. Uh, here it says, strong pillar-like legs. you got to have that. Um, um, a light, hollowed-out vertebrae. That's the neck bones. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. 
that, that uh, strengthens the, the backbone. That way, sauropods were specially adapted. I, I would say specially crafted. Why not say, say what we're looking at to grow so large? They have to have all these specializations and features in place all at once in order to do what they did. Where do they come from? Well, here I am at the Carnegie, sorry, Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, uh, and uh, there's, there's Diplodocus behind me, and you could see all those neck vertebrae and uh, raised ridges, hollowed out spaces, super lightweight, weight-saving features. Had to have it. If these were block-shaped, heavy, dense bones like most other dinosaurs' bones were, then, I mean, his, his neck would be too heavy. Uh, if his head was big and had a big brain, uh, he'd, his head would be too heavy. And, he, you know, he'd, he'd lie his head on the ground and just, I guess, eat worms until he died or something. I mean, you've got to have all these features in place for him to do what he did or she uh, walking around and, and standing in one place could eat uh, for an hour just off of one or two trees just by moving that neck, not spending a lot of energy, but gaining a lot of energy from the way that it lived its life and ate. Weight-saving neck features, um, raised ridges at exactly the point where it needed at structural integrity. So engineers marvel at how excellent these things were crafted. And I'm looking also here, I'm taking a picture um, of a few colleagues of mine working on one of the biggest um, Triceratops skulls ever found. And they found it in, uh, let's see where, the, this is in Texas, but they, they shipped it from where they found it in um, uh, Wyoming, uh, Lance Formation. So uh, 2,000 pounds, just the head. I mean, how do you anchor a 2,000 pound head to a body and have that head not just fall off? <laughs> I mean, you need a solid anchor. Have you ever thought about what it takes to hitch a 2,000 pound trailer to a car? I mean, you have to have a a sturdy, uh, well, it's a trailer hitch, and it's got a ball, and it swivels on the ball on the trailer. Same thing with Triceratops heads, and here on display at this, um, at this museum in Texas, it's, it shows the ball, you know, on the, on the th that anchors the Triceratops head to its body. There's the ball called a condyle, and then there's the socket. Uh, you can see it. Actually, I'm going to. See if I can point to it here. Here's the socket here, and it fits, it fits right on the surface of this ball. And so this connects to the vertebrae, this connects to the head, and they connect together. And that way, these creatures could actually spar with one another. I mean, they could actually take their horns and ram them into one another. We know because um, of holes in the frill, the big frill, the big head crest. Um, and the hole is just the shape of, a, of, a, of one of these horns. Anyways, so that's a lot of mass. And it's, it, needs a, it needs a tight junction. Can you imagine this 2,000-pound head connected to the body with a sauropod vertebrae, you know, those lightweight vertebrae? Oh, it just wouldn't work at all. So we have exactly the right construction for what each of these creatures' bodies needed. And Triceratops was like a walking tank. Um, and everything about it was, was just what an engineer would have done. Um, and so I think this fits what we see here in Genesis 1.25. And God made the beasts of the earth, Triceratops included, Brachiosaur included, Diplodocus included. God made, not nature made. Well, so some people say, you know, maybe, uh, maybe God made it through natural processes. Okay, maybe, he, I mean, he could, right? He could use evolution, I guess, in theory. But the problem with that is he said that he didn't. So are you going to go with what he said? Are you going to believe his word? And I've come around to thinking, yeah, I want to believe his word, just like the Lord Jesus did. The Lord Jesus took, I mean, he referred to Adam. He referred to uh, Enoch. He referred to Noah uh, and to Moses as, as though these were real people, who experienced the things that Genesis says they lived through. Jesus thought that way uh, also. And so who am I to know more than the Lord Jesus, the creator and sustainer of the universe? <laughs> so I'm going to take his word for it. And the more science I see, the, the construction, the design, where do they come from? 
clever design says they came from creation, not from evolution. Uh, if evolution explains it, then why don't we see you know, transitioning fossils that go from one form of dinosaur into another form? Or for that matter, transitioning fossils that show reptile morphing into a dinosaur. It's either a dinosaur or it's the other reptile. It's a triceratops or it's not a triceratops, or ceratopsian anyways. Um, lots of varieties of ceratopsians. Some of them had lots of little horns on their frill. Some had no horns on their frill. But all of them have the basic tank-shaped body, body plan, and some kind of frill. And so they're all ceratopsians. And God created them as ceratopsians to multiply and fill the earth, the pre-flood earth. So I think these fossils um, came from, well, the creatures came from clever design, but how did the fossils get here? So that's kind of our next, our next question. When did they live? And um, we've got two paradigms. The one I grew up believing, the paradigm I grew up believing, says that uh, these, these lived something like 200 and plus million years ago, and they all died out uh, 66 or so million years ago. Millions of years, um, and I believe that because that's all I had been taught. But um, then I started studying um, a particular feature about dinosaur bones, and that is carbon-14. So carbon-14, as I explained in the fossil session that we had a, a, a bit ago, it has a maximum shelf life of 100,000 carbon years. Those are theoretical years. That's, in theory, the longest you can get carbon-14 to last before all of it turns into nitrogen. So if we find any carbon-14 in a dinosaur bone, um, and it can, it's in the dinosaur bone, not, not stuck to the surface of it later on or anything like that, but actually in part of the bone itself, if we find that, then it's got to be fewer than 100,000 years. And so we've got two paradigms. One is the millions of years paradigm, and the other is the flood paradigm. And in this flood model, we have creation um, in Genesis 1, and then we've got the flood, Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9. And that flood occurred, according to Genesis, uh, 1,656 years after creation. Um, and the whole world was flooded, and that's thousands of years ago. So thousands of years ago would fit the thousands of years limit that radiocarbon would bring were we to find it in dinosaurs. So several years ago, back before I had all this gray, I was working here uh, at the Institute, and there I am trying to get at the interior of a hadrosaur vertebra so I could scrape away some of the, um, the bone material and send it off to a radiocarbon dating laboratory, uh, which we did. And guess what they found? Radiocarbon. Uh, we didn't tell them, you know, necessarily that this was a dinosaur bone because they would just send it back and say, well, this is ridiculous. We're not going to do this. This is obviously millions of years old. But you see, that's circular reasoning. Dinosaurs are millions of years old because we think they're millions years, years old. Why not actually f look at the data? And so we collect the data here. It's part of what we do as scientists. And we found radiocarbon as though this is fewer than 100,000 thousand years old. So the flood is fewer than 100,000 years old. I think that fits what we found there. Here is on the right a Triceratops skull on display at the Bozeman, uh, what's that museum in Bozeman? The Museum of the Rockies, I think, M-O-R. Uh, and then on the left you see uh, a, 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 a Triceratops horn core fossil that we acquired here at the Institute. And so I broke the thing, super hard to break. I mean, this, the bone and the structure of this bone is super tough. Even so many thousands of years after the flood, when this was deposited, I have now become convinced. But why? Why did I break up this beautiful fossil? Well, I want to get, I want to get at the bone that's in the middle of it. Uh, you know, I don't want the, the contaminated parts on the outside of the bone although the process of carbon dating already removes contaminants uh, by dissolving it all in acid. Um, 
but uh, nevertheless, I want to give it the best shot I can. And so I, I reached into the interior of this bone, sent it off to carbon dating lab, and we got radiocarbon, measurable amounts of radiocarbon, as though it's thousands, not millions of years old. Uh, we, we, we just kept doing this. We we're like, really? What about some of the, now this, this bone here, is, is, it's got, it's not very mineralized at all. It came from the Hell Creek Formation, so the, the minerals didn't replace the bone. This is actual bone. It looks like it's sort of been baked or something, uh, but it's got the little tiny port, it's got the structure of bone. These, however, this is Stegosaurus. This is Jurassic, so it's in layers that are below the Cretaceous layers, so they were deposited earlier than the Cretaceous layers. Um, but these are highly mineralized. So when you pick up one of these bones, it, it's, it's, it is rock in the shape of a bone, or mostly rock, or maybe it's just partly rock in the shape of bone. So we, we got a sample from, from the Carnegie Museum, and we sent it off for radiocarbon dating, and we got radiocarbon in a stegosaurus bone. What's it doing there? It, I thought it was completely mineralized. I thought that the minerals replaced the original bone. Turns out there's some original bone left, there's some original carbon left, and there's some very young looking radiocarbon still left in there. And we've collected, um, I'd say 50 samples from fossils, um, my, me and my colleagues um, uh, around the nation, uh, and we found radiocarbon in all of these. Um, so, this is actually consistent with what secular geologists have, geologists and geoscientists have found. They have found radiocarbon in coal. Some of this coal has got, you know, ages of like 300, 300 million years. Or diamonds, you see the picture of diamonds there. Um, diamonds are supposed to be a billion years old, with a B. And, and yet there's radiocarbon in coal, and there's radiocarbon in diamonds, and they publish these results in the scientific technical literature, but somehow they never make it into the classroom. They never make it into the textbooks. But I think they should, because radiocarbon is too young to be a billion years old. It's too young to be 300 million years old. It's too young to be 65 million years old. It's too young to be 100,000 years old. These things all, Fossils, earth materials, they all look young according to their radiocarbon content. Um, so when did they die? When, so we first, the first question was, you know, how did they get here? Well, God made them. That's how, you, that's how you get such excellent construction. Well, when were they around? Well, the Bible gives us a chronology or a series of timestamps. You go from, Ab from Adam to Abraham, that's about 2,000 years from the first Adam to the last Adam, sorry, from Abraham to the last Adam, that's the Lord Jesus, another 2,000, and from the Lord Jesus to today, a third 2,000 year. So it's about 6,000 years old, the whole world. Flood about 4,400 years ago. That's the Bible's chronology. If you add up all the dates and ages, uh, that's the chronology that you get. So 4,400 years ago, that's how old these fossils are, 4,400 years. Well, the thousands of years picture that the Bible gives matches um, what we see in the radiocarbon content of, of, uh, of dinosaur fossils. And, you know, this fits also with what the Lord Jesus himself said, for example, in Mark 10, 6, saying, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Jesus talking to the Pharisees about the origin of marriage. And he's saying, um, he's quoting made them male and female. That's a quote from Genesis chapter 1, as though it's literal and historical, and that God gets the credit for speaking them into existence. When did he do that? Well, billions of years after the Big Bang beginning, right? No, not at all. From the very beginning of creation, at the creation week, God made Adam and Eve, male and female, and marriage right there uh, in the beginning not billions of years after the beginning. So the Lord Jesus treated Genesis straightforwardly. And I used to not, but the more I looked at how much the science supports this recent creation and recent flood view, the more I became convinced that, you know, I think Jesus was onto something here. I think, I think the Bible deserves a little bit more of my respect. 
And uh, that started to change my life. And that's why I do what I do today here at the Institute. So when did they live? Thousands of years ago, not millions. And that means they would have gone on board Noah's Ark. Uh, unless they survived, you know, like fishes did outside the Ark, you know, smaller versions of the dinosaurs might have gone on Noah's Ark. Uh, how, much, how much of that space would have been taken up? Probably about a third, no more than 45% of the space on the ark would have been taken up by all the animals. Now, he wouldn't have put fishes on the ark. We're talking about land animals and sky animals. So birds, pterosaurs, um, a lot of them have gone extinct since the flood. But they were on board the ark and they survived through the flood on board this, this ark according to what scripture teaches. And uh, so this leads us to our next question, when did they die? When did they die? They're no longer around. I mean, they're not in my backyard. And so when did they die? Well, a bunch of them would have died in Noah's flood, and that's where we get the fossils of dinosaurs to prove to us that they really did exist. You know, I gotta make that point because I talked to my bike mechanic at the bike shop the other day, and I was like, and he was like, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a dinosaur scientist, but I believe the Bible. And so he's like, well, that's weird. You know, I talked to some Christians just the other day, he said, and they were like, they were trying to convince me that dinosaurs weren't real. And that was their way of dealing with dinosaurs, was to just pretend like they're all a fabrication. Uh, and I just think that's so irresponsible. Of course they were real, but they weren't really deposited millions of years ago. They didn't really evolve they were created, and they were deposited thousands of years ago in Noah's flood. That's why you get fossils at all. And fossils of dinosaurs are found on every continent of the globe, including Antarctica. Um, it's a global phenomenon, this fossilization, and these dinosaur fossils are global. So it takes a global cause to produce a global effect. Hey, the Bible says that there was a global flood. Maybe that's the cause. When did they die? Some of them died in that flood 4,400 or so years ago. Um, but some survived on the ark, maybe, and lived for some time after the flood. What, what would we expect to find if the dinosaurs and other extinct reptiles survived for a while after the flood? Well, we wouldn't find fossils because the fossils were formed during the flood and shortly after the flood. So you can't look in fossils. That's that's flood time, you know, that's the flood year, and maybe some fossils a little bit after the flood year. But if, if these creatures persisted into our past, you wouldn't find them, because creatures don't form fossils today. They just, they just don't. So, but you might find them in human artifacts. So we have on display here at the Discovery Center replicas of some of these artifacts that our ancestors left for us to inspect. Um, and here we have an, a, a replica of a, 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 a column at Ta Prom in Cambodia it's a medieval in a European age system. It's medieval, but anyway, it's really old, um, <clears throat> thousands of years old, this, this, this stone carved column. And looking closely, we've got this weird guy with a, um, with a lion face, um, and we've got um, real live creatures. Above it, you've got, you know, like um, a parrot, and then there's a bull, and then there's this one right here. So let me, let's just zoom into that one. And here's the real one in, there's a photo of the real one in Cambodia, and it's got these plates on its back. And boy, it looks suspiciously like um, dinosaurs that we might know from fossils only. And so how did these ancients know what this creature looked like? And were able to carve it with a reasonable amount of fidelity to the original form. I mean, no artist is perfect, so you've got to expect these guys to to get some of the anatomy a little bit off, just like you do when you draw things. <laughs> Uh, and I do, I do anyway. Maybe, maybe you're like an expert illustrator, but uh, these guys were maybe not that. Anyway, so there's that. That's Cambodia. Uh, what about uh, Egypt? So we've got these long-necked creatures and um, on this really ancient Narmer palette, the Narmer palette uh, that shows long-necked creatures. Actually, those look like these long-necked creatures on a little tiny cylinder seal. Uh, the, from Uruk, which is in modern-day Iraq, um, and this 
this, uh, this is also thousands, let's say 3000 BC, something like that. Um, that's the secular age, at least, at least several millennia old. And, and those, I mean, long tail even, long neck, necks intertwined, looks like what I saw when I went to um, Carlisle Cathedral. In fact, these um, sauropod lookalikes in a brass grave um, decoration with tails, long tails, legs go straight down, long necks intertwined. It's been worn off by foot traffic, but, th but these have uh, like tail spikes. And it wasn't until the 1990s when scientists discovered Shunosaurus, a sauropod with four tail spikes. And this guy has, of course, four tail spikes. Uh, but, but this was carved in the early 1400s, whereas this was discovered in the 1900s. And so how did they know the exact anatomy unless they saw the thing alive there, uh, at least first or second hand at least? And then in, in, in Europe, uh, we have other places in Europe, like here in Chateau du Chambord in France, we've got a Plateosaurus look-alike carved in a, in a castle. And then in Barcelona, Spain, we've got a depiction of St. George slaying the dragon. Well, where did they get this particular dragon? <laughs> it's not a dinosaur, at least, yeah, we wouldn't call it a dinosaur, but it, it exactly resembles a Nothosaurus, which is a Triassic marine, uh, uh, semi-aquatic uh, semi reptile. So the, the teeth go outside of its mouth. It's got the right size, the right body proportions, head proportion to, I mean, it fits exactly what we know from the Nothosaurus fossils, and there it is. Uh, you can see it today um, on display. Well, it's, it's in a government building, so it's not like it's on display, but it's there. Uh, and then just a few more examples to help us answer this question, when did they die? They died off, you know, after the flood in many places, in many cases. So here is a um, Nile of Mosaic, and it's in Palestrina, um, and um, it's, it's like a little temple. This, this was constructed with little pieces of tile, so it's a mosaic. And the artists who did this were alive and constructing it um, just before the Lord Jesus. So we're talking about um, 100 BC, something like that. Anyway, so they're depicting a scene on the Nile, and they're, they're looking at this. So there's, the natives are restless, and what is this thing? The Greek lettering says crocodile morph. Crocodile leopardalis, something like it's a crocodile-like and it's leopard-like, so it's mammal-like and it's reptile-like. Well, we've got fossils of mammal-like reptiles, including Gorgonopsid, with these giant um, big teeth, and you could see the giant big teeth on the on the depiction there. So anyway, the answer is the flood explains these fossils. Explains they, most of them died in the flood. So you get this whole stack of pancake layers of rock formed in just one year, and um, uh, so this is, answers our question, and it points to behemoth. Behemoth being uh, like a, it's got a tail like a cedar. It's a sauropod dinosaur alive and described by Job. And so uh, the, the science fits the scripture. When do they die? Clashes with dragons from our ancestors. It says that they died thousands, not millions of years ago. Clever design supports Genesis 1 creation. Carbon decay supports Genesis flood. And clashes with dragons supports animals, uh, um, dinosaurs alive after the flood, uh, just like Job indicates for us. Have a great rest of your session and be encouraged and equipped to know that Scripture is defensible and the God who wrote it is trustworthy himself. Thanks. Well, thanks again for, for coming tonight. I'm really happy to be here. In fact, this is probably one of my favorite talks, and I think the reason why is I'm going to summarize in the next 30 minutes or so some of the most compelling evidences that shifted me from an undeclared Christian on origins, not knowing if Earth was old or young or whatever it was, into where I am now, which is Stanley standing with my feet firmly planted on the Word of God regarding Genesis 1-11 to as real history. Uh, tonight I'm going to be summarizing a lot of evidence that comes from our flood video. Uh, this flood video, we took about a year and did research. We interviewed some of the leading experts around the world uh, that probably will ever live about this topic. In fact, Dr. Jim Bump Gardner, not to pull out only him, but just by way of example, when I met with him with, with Dave in San Diego and I said, hey, what about this in the flood? And I was drawn up on the whiteboard and going over some of my novel ideas and everything about the flood. 
when I had the humility to sit down and be tutored by this, uh, by John, he pulled up a globe and said, son, I got my PhD in geophysics from UCLA 40 years ago, and I've been studying the flood ever since. He's got some amazing detailed uh, information about the flood. It wasn't just him. It was Dr. Schnelling from Answers in Genesis, Dr. Clary from ICR, several others helped us produce this film that is now growing on almost 3 million views on YouTube. And then after that, we did a follow-up video called Noah's Flood in North America. And that's a shorter video. We just focus on what was happening on North America during Noah's Flood, which happened about 4,400 years ago. And tonight, I want to say that my viewpoint is that we're dealing with a book that's got divine inspiration, the, the, the Bible. It happens to be the longest account of any single event in God's Word. It's about three chapters long. It was written uh, by God through man, and we have to realize that God is an omniscient or all-knowing writer with an omnipresent or everywhere at once perspective on what happened on earth during the flood. So God can say things in the text through people like, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth. That requires a worldwide perspective of what's going on during the flood. So God can say that. The flood has all kinds of dates, durations, and players that are given in the account. And it starts out like this. I, most biblical creationists and evolutionists agree that Earth, uh, at one point in the past, they would say millions of years ago, we would say about 6,000 years ago when God put it there, was configured where all the continents were together. Some people have a version of what they call Rodinia on that. Some people have a Pangea perspective on that. But the Psalms is very clear. It says, in his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the, the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. So if Psalm says his hand formed the dry land, you have to ask, well, when did that happen? Genesis 1 says this, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called his seas. And God saw that it was good. So you can infer from that verse that there's one massive land continent, and then there's one, the, the rest of the, everything outside of that one land continent are the seas. And this would certainly make it easier for Adam and Eve and the families that followed to do what God commanded, to, uh, to rule over the whole, whole earth and to take dominion over the earth, the creatures, the garden, the fruits, vegetables, the whole thing, because it was all on one big continent, one big landmass. It wasn't spread out. It would certainly it'd be easier for them to take dominion over the earth if it was configured like that. Here's a couple of key flood verses I want us to focus on. The one I just mentioned where the Bible says on the same day where all the fountains of the great deep burst forth or opened up. The Hebrew there is the idea of a breaching or a cleaving, so water coming up from these linear rifts. And the windows of heaven were opened. So the, the, the key here is the flood started on the ocean floor. Very interesting to, to think about because we're going to show how the oceanic rift system supports that. The other verse, verse is that the flood peaked, or the flood zenith, um, 15 cubits upward, which is about 22 feet to the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. So here we have, just from these two scriptures, something starting on the bottom of the ocean that ended up with something ending at the top of the highest hills under heaven. So it was a top-to-bottom process involving the world. It was a worldwide event. And then Genesis 8 says, and the waters receded continually from the earth. It has the idea of an epping and flowing or receding continually from the earth. And on the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. And the ark rested on the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. It does not say the mountain of Ararat. It says on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So we have a 371-day flood process, and we can connect these two verses saying something started on the ocean floor. It was so significant it raised up to cover the highest hills over under heaven. 
So one way of viewing it, there are different perspectives on this based upon the Hebrew, but the, the position that's uh, pretty straightforward to take as the waters increase for 150 days, zenith, then after that you have 150 days of the water declining, then earth dried out for about 70 days. Uh, some people would put the zenith of the flood at day 40 uh, for reasons that they have uh, uh, for, for, for doing that. But it was at least a one year process, about 371 days. When did it happen? Well, if you follow the Masoretic text, about 2300 BC. Uh, some people, based upon the, the dates of Abraham, would change it a little bit to maybe 2518 BC. And if you follow the Septuagint, which has a, an earth that was about 7800 years old, you can put the flood about 3168 BC. And some would argue that that better encapsulates some of the Egyptian chronologies. But the flood definitely happened within that bracket, and it happened no no earlier than 3168 uh, date. And here's an article if you want to drill deeper into that. Uh, but it's certainly easy just to take the very straightforward flood date of 2350 or so. And I found it real interesting. I, I've spent a lot of times looking at different mythological flood accounts from the ancient Near East. Uh, I'm, I'm friends with Dr. Price with Liberty University, who's an expert in these tablets. And I find it fascinating that we have things like the Eridu tablet, the Sumerian King's List, the Enuma Elish, the Atrahasis, the Simmons Ark tablet, Gilgamesh. There's several different Babylonian flood myths. And look at that, they all have origins where we believe the flood quit, around the mountains of Ararat and the Mediterranean over there. And we, of course, believe that the Bible's account of the flood is the original account that was spun off and changed by all of the other ancient Near East accounts that came after that because there's a ton of overlap and similarities between all these different accounts, but the Bible is the only one that makes rational sense. It would stand up to the, the tests of history that we can put to it. So the eight common elements you'll find uh, when you compare the flood account of the Bible to a lot of these ancient Near Eastern texts are things like they all have in common a punishment or the idea that the God or gods is bringing judgment. There's usually one chosen person to be on the ark heading things up or a saved family. Uh, the animals are saved. We've got vessels that have specifications given. Uh, we have the survival of the flood. The birds find dry land. And there's a sacrifice to God or gods afterwards. They all draw from a lot of the same themes and overtones. But the Bible's the only one that makes sense. Because if you look at what happens with truth over time, is truth can sometimes get more mythical. But you're not going to have a myth become more truthful. That's the way that you, one way that you can distinguish the biblical account from all these other Babylonian flood myths because you have things like this. You've got the biblical flood says, well, you know, Noah probably had between 55 and 75 years to build the ark with lots of help uh, from his family. It was probably, it was between 450 and 515 feet long. It had to survive in the water for 371 days, and it was seaworthy. If you compare that with, for example, the Epic of Gilgamesh Ark, it took him a week to build it. It was 200 feet square on each side. It was only in the water for a week, and it was not seaworthy by anyone's imagination. When you compare that to the dimensions and the shape of the ark, which have been rigorously tested at the Criso Center uh, in, in Korea, it was a world-class test center, we've learned that the 12 different possibilities of proportions and dimensions to build the ark, it just so happens that the instructions that God himself gave to Noah built an ark that was in fact seaworthy. There is a, a scale that nautical experts use to gauge different storm levels. They're looking at the ocean swells and the wind and the gale and things like this. Uh, we hired a nautical maritime expert team, some engineers, to do a simulation between the biblical ark and the ark of Gilgamesh and found that there's no way that the Ark of Gilgamesh could have survived. It would have toppled and turned when you roll up that Buford scale. It would have flopped around. There's seven stories of animals in there that would have been all upsided on each other. Whereas the biblical Ark could withstand up to the top level of the Buford scale. Some people would say up to 100 foot swells. It didn't have to go anywhere. It just had to stay there and had to stay upright. And that's what we believe the biblical Ark uh, could have done. 
When it gets into the mechanics of Noah's, uh, Noah's flood, uh, in the early 1990s, there were these six individuals that came together and framed a theory based upon a lot of their studies that had led them all to this culminating point of understanding a, t a theory that describes the mechanics of the flood that has now become known as catastrophic plate tectonics. And this is by far the leading biblical creationist view on how the flood unfolded. We have an animation here that's showing that there was that one Pangea-like configuration that was rapidly split apart. Uh, this is from Scotis on the internet. This is one that follows the evolutionary timing. Uh, but the process is the same. We believe it was sped up. They have this over, I believe, oh, 150 million years or so on the animation you just watched. But biblical creationists believe that that actually ha happened at walking speed. It uh, happened over a year-long flood process. One of the leading experts that have helped frame this theory uh, was Dr. John Bum Gardner. He was a scientist with Los Alamos National Laboratory. He's currently over at uh, Liberty University. Uh, he came up with a program called Terra. It's a scientific software program where he broke up the earth into, I believe, 360,000 different grids and looked at what he called runaway catastrophism or, or runaway subduction, where you have earth splitting away from that Pangea configuration. The mid-Atlantic rift splits all the linear rifting around the earth, 40,000 mile network of oceanic rift begins opening up during Noah's flood. And then he's got simulations showing what it would have looked like. Uh, here's a report from US News and World Report calling uh, John, a scientist who embraces plate tectonics in Noah's flood, the geophysics of God, and they called him a, 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 a renowned expert. So here is a quick uh, animation showing a lot of Dr. Bumgardner's work. He was actually able to plot this out during all 371 days of the flood, showing that as the oceanic rifting was happening and new seafloor was being created, that seafloor was being subducted and recycled underneath the land masses at a rate that was very, very fast. We can see here Noah's flood, day 10, 20, 30, 40, how the continents are moving back and forth. He was able to model all of this using geology and earth history and a lot of physics and able to show how the continents could have split apart with what he calls runaway subduction. Today we have the leftovers of the remnant of that subduction where over 90% of, of today's earthquakes are generated by slips at these subduction zones. So we still have these subduction zones. You can see here the ring of fire that goes around all these different continents where they st we still have the new seafloor being bound to the land continents and then released at the same time and slipping. Uh, and we have uh, a lot of earthquakes today are produced by this. Here's one from uh, the 1700s. Uh, I'll show that next, but here's what the making of a tsunami uh, can look like. So we have the, the, the sea floor, the oceanic plate being subducted underneath the land continent there. When it binds, it bends back, there's a bunch of tension, and then it releases. And when it releases, it sends out a bi-directional tsunami, and this was happening in cycling waves during the flood, and that's why we have so many stratified layers of mud and sediment and dead creatures, marine life that's buried with land creatures, all together because this, this system of binding and releasing was happening rapidly as the seafloor subducted at about five miles per hour during Noah's flood. And a quick video shows what happened in the 1700s where there was a, a subduction related tsunami that came over and, and hit Washington. And it left these three different, very, very controlled, distinct strata layers that you can still see in the soil. And that happened in 1700. In 2011, we have the same type of thing happening in, in Japan where there was a binding between the seafloor and the landmass. It slipped, moved several feet actually, and caused a, direction, a directional tsunami to go out in both direction, uh, directions, creating all of the havoc that we saw, we all watched on the news. The next evidence I found really interesting is on fossil correlation. 
Uh, we can know if we look at the different continents and, and study them, there are places where animals and biology uh, and, and herbs and plants are along the same regions of what used to be Pangaea, but when it was broken apart, we can see that they still strata, straddle those same areas. Uh, in fact, it gets really detailed when you start looking at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, uh, where we have here, you can see that huge 10,000 mile rift. These circles are fossils of certain types of organisms that used to be together. They were living, the fountains of the great deep burst open, linear rift rifting happened, pulled these continents apart, and were able to correlate the same types of biostratigraphy in, in animals and plants are at the same sides on each shelf of these different continents that used to be there living at the same time, but were rapidly split apart, and they're now both buried in mud. How would you do that? It has to be done catastrophically. They were found buried in the very, very mud that killed them. Uh, here's what the Mid-Atlantic Ridge looks like when you look at it uh, from a bathymetric map. It's a 10,000 mile split that goes all the way down the continents as seen there, and it actually has sloped ridges to it. So it was happening quickly, sliding these continents apart that are now thousands of miles apart. And when you look at North America, it was what's called the Farallon Plate, which is what subducted as new ocean floor was being created. It was pushed up against the west coast of America and rapidly subducted. And when it was doing that, it was carrying along with it several oceanic plateaus or sea mount form, for formations, volcanic sea mount formations, that while they were pulled underneath the continent, wreaked havoc in the middle of America, creating a 13 state kill zone of the dinosaurs. Um, and there was a lot of volcanism rapid, uh, that was due to these rapidly subducting plates. As I mentioned in my earlier talk, that these dinosaurs in the middle of America aren't just buried in mud, they're not just buried in sand, they're buried in mud, sand, and ash. And the ash was due from the volcanic, the volcanics that were involved when the rapid subducting was happening underneath the continent. So here is an animation. You can see the rapid seafloor subducting, the volcanic activities coming up, spouting forth uh, new volcanics, all, all the, the ash is falling, the Independence Dyke Swarm, which is now in LA, split open. It's a 370 mile rift produced tons of ash, unimaginable amounts of ash during the subduction process. And that's why the dinosaurs to this day, over half of America, are buried in the very ash that was involved in their demise. You can go to these different places around the Midwest and still find this ash today. And geologists admit, yeah, it came from California. It was blown over and there was so, so much of it. So after the flood, we have declining subduction-related volcanism. So the Independence Dyke Swarm was a huge volcano that was on the, the, the southern part of California that brought over enough ash to cover about half of America. And then after that, we had several other volcanoes that waned in the extent. So we have uh, the, the Long Valley eruption, the Crater Rake eruption, we have the Mount St. Helens. So when this process was happening, we had the big one first, the Independence Dyke Swarm, then after, and the tailing end phases of the flood, and other ones, we had volcanic, other volcanic eruptions that systematically started declining in strength and the amount of ash being produced as the declining plate, the, the ocean plate went down, down, and down, and it started waning back. And all the way, we get to the more recent one of Mount St. Helens, not the most recent one, but the earlier eruptions of Mount St. Helens. So they were just declining, and th this really shows we had something drastic at first, which Tim Clary from ICR would call during the Zuni formation, or the Zuni mega sequence, which is the top of when the, 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 the worst happened, the worst of everything happened during the, in the flood to the dinosaurs, wiped them all out, finally overran the dinosaur peninsula that they were making their last stand on and buried them all. It was these, these consistent subsequent eruptions that were burying them in ash, sand, and mud. That's why when you go to places like in the middle of Utah or Wyoming, you find these creatures are buried in a matrix of all three of those materials. You've got mud, ash, and sand. And this happened in stages, the Jurassic stage or the, the, the Jurassic 
uh, area was buried first, followed by the Cretaceous. We can see all these circles are giant fossil beds. Uh, caused the Morrison Formation, which is this huge 13 state region, over 700,000 square miles where marine life and land creatures are buried together. 141 massive bone beds with millions upon millions of animals all buried together, and only about 75% of it, or 25% is exposed, 75% is still buried, so some massive catastrophe happened in this region. And the dinosaurs, this is a quote from the, from the, the dinosaur park in Utah, they're buried in a jumbled mass together with crocodiles, turtles, lizards, frogs, and clams. You just have to ask what type of catastrophe could bury 13 states of dinosaurs, 700,000 square miles, and bury them with crocodiles, turtles, lizards, frogs, and clams. Had to be a worldwide catastrophe. Here's uh, based on Dr. Clary's work where the dinosaur peninsula was. We've got a lot of dinosaur trackways in this area. That was the last high ground before the final stage of the flood during the Zuni uh, stage buried everything. And that makes up the, the majority of the fossil evidence that we have today. When you go around and look at secular museum signs in these areas, I find it fascinating that most, if not all of them, admit that the dinosaurs are buried there from a massive watery catastrophe. Things like hundreds of dinosaurs buried together um, with shark teeth, or you know, they always talk about some massive watery inundation, which is exactly what fits the data. Another very convincing thing that this happened quickly and recently is the peer-reviewed scientific science uh, journals uh, not creationist publications, but these are peer-reviewed secular science journals that have now uh, accumulated and reported 16 different types of dinosaur organic biological material. Things like effects, uh, histones, proteins, collagen, blood vessels, blood cells, cartilage, collagen, all these things that belong organically to dinosaurs that had to be entombed recently ca and, and catastrophically. Here is a clip from the Is Genesis History uh, video showing Dr. Uh, Dr. Mark Armitage stretching out this flexible dinosaur horn from a triceratops. He can grab his, his forceps and, and uh, uh, different tools there and stretch, stretch it apart. You can see how stretchable this material is. Certainly doesn't look like 65 mil million year old material to me. So there's really two different ways of looking at this. The question is, how did these 13 states get filled with millions of dead things that are found on both land creatures and marine creatures get buried and mixed together? The one hypothesis would be, well, slowly over millions of years. And the other hypothesis that we're advocating here is that it happened rapidly over a year period. Here's a video that was on National Geographic showing the subducting Farallon plate that was responsible for the Laramide orogeny. This is from Dr. Paul Heller and some of his colleagues that showed when the Farallon plate subducted under the North American continent, they say it was like a spatula sliding under an undercooked pancake. When it did that, it caused a lot of these mountains to rapidly rise up, which were involved in catastrophically killing the dinosaurs. And here we can use uh, underground radar and show that the Farallon plate subducted. We see the, the different temperature ranges of this Farallon plate that subducted, showing that it was an event that happened in the different stages that we believe it happened in. The question is, how could these dinosaurs have died off over millions of years when this Farallon plate was slowly and gradually just kind of cruising underneath North America uneventfully? it certainly couldn't have done that because if it was moving under the North American continent drastically enough to push up the Laramide orogeny with all these mountains being pushed and bubbled up, it had to happen quickly. And it was involved in rolling the, a huge amount of this earth, I guess is the only way to say it, with North America, but it's catastrophically involved in killing the dinosaurs. It was a process that happened quickly. You can't have these dinosaurs living peacefully for 25 million years just cruising around while the oceanic plates are subducting with widespread volcanism occurring. 
That's why these dinosaurs are, built in, uh, are buried in both ash, mud, and sand. It's because the ash from all these volcanoes was being pushed up at the same time. The Farallon plate was subducting, creating huge cataclysmic power, burying these dinosaurs, and the ash came down over the top of them along with mud and tsunamis and buried them in the exact taphonomy that we see today. So here we have 13, you know, 13, 13 or 14 states, three partial countries over a million square miles, 1,800 miles long. It's a huge, massive dinosaur kill zone. And there we have the Dinosaur Peninsula where they made their last stand before the last stages of the flood inundated and buried them. So, well, what do evolutionists say about this? The evolutionists say, well, these dinosaurs died, you know, from the, from the asteroid that came and hit the Chicxulub uh, Peninsula in Mexico. This one big asteroid came there and fell. Well, okay, if, if that's the case and you have one asteroid that's responsible for the whole demise of the dinosaur, how does that fit then? Because here we have where it would have landed and we have the effects from the water that would have push back and the tsunamis that it would have pushed back from this one asteroid hitting in one location, it does nothing to come up and closely hit that 1,800 mile long stretch of a kill zone. Maybe it touches the bottom southern parts, but it certainly can explain how you have 13 states filled with di dead dinosaurs in the middle of America. If we have an asteroid land here at the Chicxulub uh, Peninsula, how in the world is that impact, which is simulated here, supposed to go up and be responsible for, for killing and burying 13 states worth of dinosaurs in this type of sediment? Uh, this is a, a clip showing uh, you know, what it must have looked like when the water's coming up from subduction-related tsunamis, not from an asteroid. The asteroid uh, ex explanation simply does not make sense. The only way you can bury that 13 state regions uh, fill, filled with dead dinosaurs is to bring the ocean up on land catastrophically. That's the only way you can bury the entire family of hadrosaurs. We can see the Jurassic layers that are buried, followed by the Cretaceous layers that were buried next. We have the dinosaurs that are found in the downslopes of these Cretaceous areas. And we have the entire dinosaur family buried along both sides of this shelf. And we have a lot of them buried along the dinosaur peninsula there. We have all the T-Rexes or all the Allosauruses that, that are buried there in the Jurassic. The sauropods are buried in this zone. The stegosauruses are, are buried in this zone. You can plot them all out. They also happen to be living in the same regions when they were catastrophically buried. Pterosaurs are interesting because they could fly. They're found in all three sections of strata. They're found in the Triassic, uh, strata, they're found in the Jurassic and they're found in the Cretaceous because they could fly and get away from a lot of this craziness that was going on before they eventually bought it and had to get buried. But they're found all buried throughout the entire Meso Mesozoic strata. We can see here there's the Cretaceous layers that they're buried in and then in the uh, Jurassic areas that we find those same types of creatures. So one question would be, this, does it make more sense that all the dinosaurs died during the same one year flood while living in different habitats or that they died out in the same areas with those same little circle bubble fly ends uh, over a 180 million year period, all buried in ash, mud, sand with marine life. These creatures were smart. They could have survived. Something happened that overwhelmed them all, buried them together in the same area. You think about America today, well, during the 1800s, there were between 50 and 60 million buffalo roaming around America. Where are they now? They're gone. Where are their fossils? They're not preserved because there wasn't a flood to do it. So we can go from millions and millions and millions of buffalo roaming around the North American continent to almost no trace of them because there wasn't a flood to preserve them. The reason why we have a 13 state region of dead dinosaurs in the middle of America is because there was a catastrophic process that buried them all. 
Here's a couple of just extra tidbits that I found fascinating. This is a book from John Horner uh, called Digging Dinosaurs. The subtitle of this book is The Search That Unraveled the Mystery of the Baby Dinosaurs. This is a kill zone, a dinosaur kill zone in Montana, where he's, John says, we had one huge bed of myasaurus bones stretching 1.25 miles east to west. So imagine this. There's a stretch a mile and a quarter long with dead myasaur dinosaurs, but what they found in this 30 million fossil collection was the tomb of 10,000 adult myasaur dinosaurs. In this entire collection, they didn't find a single fossil specimen of anything that was juvenile or baby. The adults Sensing and, and or seeing that Noah's flood was coming, the entire herd of 10,000 bolted and ran for higher ground, leaving behind everything else that couldn't keep up. John says, how could any mudslide, no matter how catastrophic, have the force to take a two or three ton animal that had just died and smash it around so much that its femur, still embedded in the flesh of its thigh, could split lengthwise? So he's looking at the taphonomy and the burial conditions and the, the burial nature of these bones saying, wow, some type of worldwide blender hit these bones, killed 10,000 adults altogether, blended them together and buried them in an emplacement that they can go dig up today. 10,000 adult myasaura, all 10,000 were between nine and 23 feet long. Not a single baby or juvenile was found. Sounds like a worldwide flood. Another thing I found very interesting is during the Tejas stage or the retreating stage of the flood, there was a great amount of she the water sheeting and planing off of the continents that left these submarine canyons. If you take a tour down the west coast of America, uh, on even Google Earth, you can see these huge underwater channels and, and canyons that were carved out. These are, these are even bigger than the Grand Canyon that were carved out by rapidly rushing water as the, as the continents were tilting back, breeding all the water in sheet flow off of the continents, chiseling through and creating these huge underwater canyons on both sides of America. It's just very clear evidence of water sheeting off of the continent. So in summary, we have over a million square miles that are filled with billions of land, land and sea creatures buried together in ash, mud, and sand layers that killed them. Soft tissues and dinosaurs uh, reveals rapid and recent burial. We have rapid catastrophic uplift that was involved due to subducting oceanic plates. Widespread massive volcanism uh, that buried the creatures in ash while the subduction was happening. It wasn't an afterthought, it happened when it was happening and it, they're buried in this very ash that killed them. We have folded and geologically bent strata and massive submarine canyons on both coasts. These are five or six of the key highlights I think that are quite convincing about Noah's flood. There are a lot more, but these are some ones that I found quite interesting. I wanna sum up uh, and end by this by sharing a, a quick story. My daughter and I and son uh, went to the Dinosaur Provincial Park up in Canada. We we're at this outside museum exhibit. It was probably 110 degrees out there. And we're looking at this dead buried Edmontosaurus, a duck-billed dinosaur. It's covered in, by this plexiglass structure. And it was just me and my daughter and, and, and my son. And there was a dad there with his son, maybe 10 years old. And the son, and the dad came up and pushed the button on the museum audio tape that supposedly explained how this creature got here. And the museum tape said something like, well, millions of years ago, this creature came to a tropical flood. It was involved in a tropical flood and the creek turned into a river and the river overflowed its banks. And one by one, these animals tried swimming for it and couldn't make it to the other side and then drowned. And my daughter, Michaela, just had an epiphany and she almost embarrassingly got really loud in front of this dad and the son and said, are they, they've got to be kidding me. 
She says, as far as I can see, for miles, there are these buried hoodoos that are filled with dinosaurs from over 30 different species, and they're buried with birds and fish and clams and oysters, as far as I can see. And they're saying it was a tropical storm when a number of these creatures are 50 feet under the mud. How much higher would the ocean have to be to bring 50 feet of mud on top of these creatures and bury them as far as my eye can see? In fact, it's a 14 mile stretch filled with over 30 different species of dinosaurs buried with mud, fish, clams, the whole works. So she has her epiphany. She has her, oh my gosh, Noah's flood is real moment right in front of this dad and, and, and his son. And it was almost a little bit embarrassing because the louder she got, the, the dad kind of was getting close to me and he was obviously eavesdropping. We're the only people out there. It was 110 degrees. And so I'm like, yeah, Michaela, wow, that's the same epiphany I had a few months ago, but I'm glad you had it now. We recovered from that. <clears throat> We're walking back inside, and she said, Dad, it's so hot. I'm going to go in and get an ice cream. And I said, that's fine. I'm going to go, go to straight to the car, turn on the air conditioning, and I'll, I'll come pull you up. On my way out to the car, the dad walked uh, diagonally over in the parking lot and kind of intercepted me. And I said, oh, my gosh, here, here we go. I'm thinking inside, one, one more hostile atheist conversation. What's he going to say? And he was real respectful, and he says, sir, do you have a minute? I said, of course, go, go ahead. And he says, look. I listened to everything your daughter said out at that out, out, outdoor exhibit. He said, I'm a licensed geologist. I've been steeped in evolutionary training about strata, geology, taphonomy, the whole works. And then he said, in five minutes after listening to your daughter, I have completely changed my mind. He said, her explanation of what we can see there with that 14 mile stretch of dead dinosaurs buried with fish and birds and clams, makes more sense and better explains the evidence and everything I learned while getting my, ge my geology license. And he said, you know what, I used to be a Christian, then I went to school and got my degree in geology and kind of just let go of my biblical perspectives, but I'm going to come back to him because I have a lot of unlearning to do. And strangely, I bumped into him the next day at the Royal Terrell Museum. He happened to be behind me. It's kind of like we had some, some more divine encounters there, but it was incredible hearing that in five minutes, this licensed geologist had completely renounced his evolutionary worldview and adopted a biblical worldview because the evidence plainly lined up to the most obvious conclusion that these creatures were rapidly buried in a flood. Okay, I think that will conclude my session for tonight. Thank you for attending. Uh, and as usual, please email us questions. We answer questions every day. Uh, just email them to staff at Genesis Apologetics. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks. So Andy, we have known each other now for five plus years. I'll never forget meeting you at one of the conferences that we did. Yeah. I think it was at a hotel. It was like a three week series that we did. And I remember meeting you out in the parking lot and you gave me some really unique background and incredible testimony. And ever since I heard it, I thought we need to have more people hear this because your journey was really from not only being, from not being neutral, from not being agnostic. I understand that you were, you were an atheist. And then by God's work and through his word and in time, you made a huge jump across the chasm. You went from atheism to a person of faith now. So yes. I was just hoping you could fill us on in that big picture and tell us what that journey looked like. Yeah. So I, I grew up as kind of like a Christmas Easter Catholic where you go Christmas and Easter and that's pretty much it. Um, I'd never really had a demonstration of the gospel um, and by, as you're probably not surprised, by a junior high, high school, I would say I was about an atheist. Although I wouldn't say I would wear the badge of atheism because it wasn't really something that you, you belonged to at the time. Not, it's not like today where you can go on Google and Twitter and, and find atheists everywhere. Um, it was a little bit more spread out back then. So around uh, after high school, I, uh, I met my wife and we, uh, we started dating. And she had told me that if I wanted to date her, I would have to come to church. And at the time, I had done the whole church thing, so I was, I was okay with it. Um, and in the back of my head, I'm thinking, okay, well, we can just deconvert her slowly, and then we'll move on. <laughs> um, so fast forward, uh, I, we're married, 
uh, I'm an atheist, and I'm going to church. Mm. So our pastor at the church had either knew someone or was aware of somebody who acquired some Dead Sea Scroll fragments. And they had brought them to the church to put them on display. And during that time, they presented on how the Bible came to be. How did, how did this library you know, get leather bound and, and show up here in yeah. this one giant book? Um, this was all just brand new to me. I had never seen any of this information before. And I had learned from school, from movies, from TV, that the Bible was a book of fairy tales. It wasn't actual history. And so now to see that, wow, Paul was actually a person and he was actually writing to the Corinthians, which were real Christians in a place and time in history. Mm. Um, this was enough to just tear the rug out from under me. Yeah. Uh, later on, uh, as you know, the church is continuing to do a little bit of apologetics, uh, the pastor challenged the church to say, hey, you need to know what you believe and why you believe it. And I had to admit to myself that I didn't know what I believed and I didn't know why I believed it. So... I did something I had never done before. I prayed. And I said, okay, I'm going to go to the atheist side. And I'm going to look for everything that they have against you, against the Bible, you being God, and against uh, Christians in general. Mm. And uh, I still feel a little embarrassed about it because I'm, I'm sitting here telling the creator of the universe what I want him to do. But um, anyway, so that that's, was his half. And then I said, okay, what I was going to do was I wasn't going to accept that there was no, arg there, there was no answer as an answer. And uh, I didn't realize at the time, but in the future, that argument would come at me again and again and again. Because they would present an argument and then it would say that Christians have no answer to this. And I had to rest on that promise of, okay, I'm not going to accept that. I'm going to go and dig. I'm going to listen to the other side. And I'm going to weigh these things and, and really uh, flesh it out. And uh, if you think of my journey, if you think of uh, a map of the world, think of that map completely blacked out. You can't see anything on the map. And then think of wherever you are in the world is lit up. Imagine you went to another country, and then that part of that country would light up. And then anywhere else you go, they start to light up, and you start to see more of the map. That was what my journey was like. And it started off really, really, was really looking back, it's really simple things. But uh, at the time, it was, it was earth-shattering to me. And those were just simple claims of Bible contradictions. The, the main claim to the, the type of argument was that the Bible is internally inconsistent. And so why would you believe something that's, that's clearly written by a bunch of different people? It has no uh, overarching author whatsoever. And so um, as I'm going through those, it's, it's interesting looking back because I had to read more of the Bible as I'm dealing with these kinds of arguments. <laughs> Good lead in. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting how I, very, I feel very led through this, this whole thing because as I'm looking now at, at the map of this journey. It's, it's, there's a lot of lights lit up all over the place. And I'm looking at where I started and where I started, they were really easy. And I'm looking at all the other things. I'm like, that would have totally destroyed me. That would have totally destroyed me. But I never got those. It was as if I was kind of being led through the easy stuff first to kind of build me up so that way I can deal with the other ones later when I had a little bit more strength in me. And... Uh, so that, that, was, that was an interesting thing there. But one argument came later, and I'm going to try to quote this as best as I can. Uh, it was a, a debate between an atheist, who I can't remember his name, uh, between him and William Lane Crank uh, a really long time ago. And he said, if there was no Adam and Eve, then there was no fall. There was no uh, original sin. If there was no original sin, then there's no need for a savior. And if there's no need for a savior, then I submit to you that that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. And I think absolutely that evolution is the death knell of Christianity. And this was oh, hitting so hard for me because everything prior to then was something that was over there on the table. I didn't have a personal stake in whether the Bible was, was you know, internally consistent or not, but I already believed in evolution. So to say that evolution was the thing that makes the Bible wrong, all of a sudden I'm like, I have to now either be inconsistent with what I just said that I was going to investigate, or I'm going to have to put something I believe on the table. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was 
very, very, very stressful. At you that got time. skin in the game at that. I point. I got skin at yeah. the game at that <clears throat> point, um, and so that sparked the journey of just going through the whole creation evolution debate. And um, I found that at a certain point, I could no longer hold on to evolution as a story of the history of the world. And I remember there was this, this period of time where in, it kind of in my mind, I saw myself and then it was as if the camel was backing out like to where you can see the world and then you can see the galaxy and then all of a sudden the whole universe. And I'm like, this is a God created universe. And that became my worldview. And it was at that point that I could really give myself over and I could surrender to, to God because now this, it was true enough to me that I, can, I could give myself over to it. Wow, that is fantastic. So to take me from there, from the point where you realize there is a God or a divine creator, what was your journey like going from there through different Christian camps on perspectives on origins to becoming a biblical creationist? What was that journey like? So the interesting thing is that the atheist community drove me straight to a reading, uh, me reading Genesis by myself, um, and then them arguing against the young earth creationists. The, the argumentation that they used was, that the Bible is inconsistent with the world around us. And so that put them in stark contrast between evolution and stark contrast between the age of the earth um, being you know, 4.6 billion years old. So I had jumped straight into the young earth creation camp and seeing like, okay, you two defend each other, you know, or you know, debate each other on this and see which side is better. And I fell into the young earth camp. Only later, when I started to try to, you know, share my faith, did I suddenly realize that Christians, like even in my own church, didn't believe that the earth was young. And I started asking, you know, questions to, about people, anyone that, that, would, that would answer, you know, hey, so what do you believe about Genesis? What do you believe about this? And I was, I was horrified. I'm like, you guys are accepting the atheist origin story. And the apologists who are pushing evolution, the apologists who are pushing old earth, even if you don't believe in evolution, you just believe in old earth, they were asking me to accept something I had already rejected. They were asking me to accept the origin story of atheism, that the, the world essentially made itself and reject what the Bible, in my mind, clearly taught. Okay, so it sounds like you were then at that point able to take the biblical narrative on top of the origins account and evidence and overlay the two and they seem to match tightly. Yes. Whereas you saw some of the other camps were like, no, what is the story of the evolutionary mindset and worldview and how can we now wrap that or curve that around the Bible? And you saw an inconsistency there. Yeah. Um, all throughout the Bible, um, you have a problem because let's say you take Genesis 1. And you say, okay, well, a day doesn't have to mean a day. Okay, fine. Well, in Exodus, it does say that in six days he created the earth, or the world, and it rested on the seventh day. So in Exodus, we know what a day means. And if you're going to say, well, the structure of Genesis is not the, um, you know, is, is not actual historical narrative, it's, it's something else. Well, okay, we have the same structure in Exodus mm -hmm. at the dedication of the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. When you have each tribe coming forward and bringing um, their gifts, it's, lay, it's uh, structured in the same way that Genesis 1 is. So is that not real history? Hmm. And then you have the problem of, well, Jesus is talking about marriage. Um, he's challenged and he's asked, you know, about marriage. And he says, well, haven't you read from the beginning he made them male and female? And this is one of the, the ones that uh, I haven't really seen a good argument on the other side where they say, you know, well, Jesus said from the beginning he made them male and female. Well, if evolution is true or if long ages is true, it's not the beginning of creation. Yeah. It is well towards the end. Yeah. And there are all these little inconsistencies all over the place where you start to break the Bible. And though the individual person might be fine with those inconsistencies, it's their children that the atheists come after, whether it be through, through the schooling or whether it be through um, you know, the evangelist atheists who go out and talk to people. They're talking to the kids of the people who are holding these beliefs. Mm -hmm. And well, they're seeing the inconsistencies. That's very good. Let's talk about family for, for a minute. As you become a Christian and you align yourself with holding to the creation account, how has it impacted you as a dad and as a, as a family man now? So, yeah, my, my worldview is, is interesting because 
coming from atheism, I, I didn't get rid of all my atheist beliefs all at once, because they, they didn't, just didn't come up. So as they come up, as you, you know, I have four kids now, um, as they've come up little at a time, I've slowly had to dust them off and say, well, is this really something I should be hanging on to? No. How should I think about this biblically? Um, and that, that's been an interesting journey. And uh, I feel very passionate about learning as much as I can because I know that my kids are going to have to deal with these things. And if I don't know how to defend these things, they're not going to know how to defend these things. And so training them up and teaching them um, from an early age uh, what the arguments are going to be, slowly bringing them kind of like same, through the same journey that I went through. Um, I'll, I'll challenge my oldest sometimes and I'll just put the atheist hat on and I'll argue from, from the point of view of an atheist and I'll let him fester for a little bit and then help him work through those things later. And I think that's so important because as they go, grow up and they go off into the world, they're going to experience these things. And if they're not prepared, they'll be swept off. So as a dad, you're intentionally creating some tension mm -hmm. between their worldview and what the world is teaching to say, hey, dwell on this pace, this place of uncomfortableness for a while, and this tension, and then you come back with the biblical creation perspective and pull them back, back into it. So I think that's very, very important. We, we see a lot of parents that just teach creation, creation, creation. It's all they get. But by the time they're 18 or 19, they don't know enough of the, the atheists and the evolutionary worldviews and arguments to be able to stand strong. They go off to college, and it's usually after the first year that they get their faith erased. They come back and the self-pronounced atheists. I don't know how many times I've heard parents say that in their journey. Well, I raised my kid. They went to Wednesday night youth group, and we went to Sunday church together and everything, and then I send them off to whatever secular institution. And after the first semester, they came back at Christmas and they no longer believe it. It was a philosophy teacher, geology, whatever it was. An yeah. informed atheist knows the Bible better than your kids do. Mm. And they can turn it against you very easily if you don't know, if you've never dealt with these things before. Yeah. And so, yeah, get, getting, getting this stuff at them early so they have time to, to deal with it in a safer environment yeah. is very important. Absolutely. Nice. That's great. All right, well, thank you for, for coming on today. We appreciate this, and uh, we'll see you next year, too. It's good to see you again. All right.